I just want to say how great it is and has been uh, just to be here these last couple of days. I, I, I also, it, it's, it's amazing how much you can accomplish in a short amount of time, uh, just to open up this letter and to, and to look at it together. But to me, the, the personal joy of, of being able to do this with uh, who I consider family, and, and that, that, that might seem a little strange that some of us have not met or know each other very well, um, but, we, but we have signed on uh, to be a part of something that's going beyond this world. And in, a, in the truest sense, this, this is our family. This is a new kind of kinship. And so whether I've known you for years or not, there's a blessing in this. Um, it's also, I think, one of the most rewarding things about being in Christ for a, an amount of time is, is watching growth and maturity uh, in others. And I, and I, I, I don't want to be, be done here today without saying how um, just mighty proud of, of Cole I am. I, I was talking to Chris before we, we talked about coming up here and kind of just asking where's everybody at and what's going on. And, um, you know, Cole, my, my last interaction with him, he was maybe nine or eight, as well as my middle son. And they, they, were, they were just like immediate friends, um, just a terror, but great. Uh, just had fun. But to watch him and his maturity, your, your song leading, I'm so proud of, uh, your ability to do all this, you know, the, everything we demand uh, from, from the IT guy. And to know that you're working for Seattle's Best Coffee is really great. Uh, is that right? No, I don't know that other one. Starbucks. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I only tease a little because I love you so much and really proud of you and proud of all of you to know that wherever you've been, you're not. Wherever you're going, you're not there yet. But, but in the middle of that, there's some great joy. Hardships, yes. Difficulties, for sure. That's a promise. Jesus guarantees it. Trouble, absolutely. But there's a joy in knowing that all of this is just a passing through. It's a temporary thing. And, and so as we look into infectious joy, I, I want to talk for, for this time we have together uh, about joy in peace. Boy, doesn't that sound great? I'll tell you what, what's absolutely surprising about the kind of joy that the Bible talks about. What's actually counterintuitive when compared to the kind of joy we think about in this world is that you can't imprison the joy of Jesus, the joy the Spirit produces. You, you can't chain it up. You can't lock it away by circumstances. And we've said this throughout. I just want to remind you this morning. Joy is going to be your loyal companion if Jesus is your constant obsession. If he's your focus, if he is your mind, your thought, it's going to change you. And I, I love the way Paul words this, actually. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, he talks about some of what, what I just said, but just puts it so much better. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And, and that kind of belief, that kind of mindset would lead a man like Paul to say, to live is Jesus Christ, but to die is gain. And I've, I've known Trish Bass my whole life. Um, and I will tell you, in a great many ways, looked up to her. And I've kind of struggled with how to think about what we're praying for and what we're asking God about. And I'll tell you, this book helps us with some of that. Because God might deliver her in her body. And he can do that. And that would not be a problem and we would rejoice. But God might deliver her from this body. And we know, as Paul said, it would be far better to go on and be with the Lord. And so we just pray right now, God's will be done. And, and we just ask that you continue to, to do that. Um, look, to die and to live with Jesus is my joy. That's, that's, that's kind of what, what kind of wraps this whole thing up. And so Bible's out in and, and chapter four. And, and what we'll do just uh, with, with the rest of our time is we'll, we'll just take on a part of this. This will be section one. If you need an outline, do you have outlines in the back if that helps you to study? Um, and, and Chris will hand those out if you just put your hand up. And that would be um, chapter four, part one on those outlines. Just let him know and he'll hand those out. And I will do this to start. I'll tell you a story. I read this article and I absolutely loved it. Uh, this was from a couple years ago now. Uh, but, but a group of young millennials were getting together and the plan was we're going to have a, a grill out uh, barbecue. I, I realized this as I, I moved that way. If you say barbecue, people think something different. So it's a grill out. Um, and, and they realized pretty quickly as everybody brought what they wanted, nobody knew how to grill. Uh, and so they put a Craigslist ad out for a dad. 
They say we're, we're, we're looking for a, a generic dad. We, 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 need, we need somebody that has at least 18 years experience as a dad and at least 10 years grilling experience. He needs to be the kind of dad that calls everybody champ or sport. And he needs to talk about dad things like lawnmowers or Jimmy Buffett. And he needs to have a solid dad name like Bill, Dave, or Randy. And what these millennials captured, I love, and it's a truth. You need to have the right person if it's going to be a party. There's no joy if the wrong people show up. And, and we all know this, and I just get you to think quietly about this. We all know those people that when they show up, just by their presence, they bring joy to the environment, right? And listen, we all know those people that just by showing up, their very presence sucks the joy right out of the room. Don't look at anyone. <laughs> the world has its fair share of joy suckers, doesn't it? It may be at work. It, it, it may be uh, at school. It could very well be in your own home. I'll just give you a couple little indicators here in my own life that I've seen this happen. It was about, uh, what, 22, 23 years ago now. I, I first started preaching in Port Townsend, Washington. And I was a brand new preacher, and it was my very first work. And uh, some men from my, my childhood congregation were, were coming up, and they had actually helped support me in this work. And I was so excited they were coming. And they talked about, you know, going to golf. And I, you know, never, never did do a whole lot of golfing. It was a, it was a cost thing, but I had saved up. And, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay for these three men, and we're going to go golfing. And, uh, and one of them, uh, one of the elders I'd known my whole life, he said, well, you know, if you can afford this, maybe we, we don't need to support you anymore. And I'll tell you, that was off-putting. Um, if I'm, I'm open with you, it just kind of sucked the joy out of what I thought would be just a kind gesture. And, and you've all run into that, right? And, and I'll tell you, if you're patient, God will get even. Uh, because somebody else came into our group, uh, and he didn't want to golf. He didn't want any, anything to do with golf. He just liked us, and he wanted to be around us. So he followed us everywhere we went. And he kind of took notes, like every swing. He's like, oh, these clubs, and uh, oh, I hooked it, or I sliced it, or oh, that trap is so big. And everybody had something to say. And about the seventh hole, he spoke up. He goes, guys, I think I know the problem. He said, none of you are as good at this as you think you are. And I will tell you, as that sucked joy out of some men's day, it was refreshing to me because it was reality. So what we've been doing so far in this study is we're asking ourselves, how can we discover that infectious joy? You, you know it. You know it when you see it. You know it when you share it. It's, it's real. It's of God. How can we rediscover that? And here's what we've learned just to kind of go through so far. The Bible tells us that joy is not a matter of chance. It's a decision. It's a choice. You, you, you decide this is where I want to be. And, and God tells us, you don't, you don't just sit around and wait for all the things in your life to go the way you want them to go, and, and then you've reached this destination of joy. It, it doesn't work that way. You choose joy regardless of your situation. And, and Paul makes this especially clear in chapter 4, as we're going to see. And I'll, I'll just kind of reiterate the verse we started out with. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, now here's why that short verse is such a powerful verse. In just a few words, Paul commissions us to joy three times. And I know you think my math is bad, so I'll walk you through this. He says rejoice, that's past tense in the Greek. It's in other words, keep on doing it. It's that rejoy, rejoy. So there's your first one. He says rejoice always. That always counts because it means don't stop. You rejoice and you joy again. Do it always. And then he says, I'll say it again. And that's just in case you didn't hear. Rejoice. So three times he's telling us you must choose joy. Now, throughout this letter, Paul's showing us the ways that we do this. And again, just a quick recap. In chapter one, we pursue joy in discovering God's agenda over our own. You're just not going to be a joy-filled person if what you want is the most important thing in your life. So Paul says, I live to praise Jesus. You can put me in chains, but you can't lock up my joy because Jesus will never leave me. He'll not abandon me. And that's true. You, you could not put Paul anywhere where he couldn't lift Jesus up. And then chapter two, you'll never find joy trying to make life submit to you because life will not bow down to your will. So we're told to look to the interests of others. And Jesus said, it's better to give than receive. What a powerful message that is. And that's a path to unchained joy. And then chapter three, 
we learned this morning. Legalism is not a path to joy. You will never be happy trying to prove to yourself, others, and God just how good you are. In fact, what I've found, what I've discovered, people that end up on that path, most of the time by accident, they never wanted to be there. It's a habit, it's a bad decision, it, it just happens over time, is they're so disappointed because they know in their heart of hearts they've never done enough. And they feel disappointed and disillusioned. And so Jesus gives us a better path. And so in chapter four, we're going to take this into two lessons here now. We're going to start to talk about one of the greatest joy killers we face in this life. And I believe this because my experience proves it out. But there's also some research behind it. I, I, had, I had read recently that when you buy an, an electronic book and you download it, uh, Amazon actually is able to track the things that you highlight in that book. And if you don't know this, this is actually encouraging, the Bible is the most downloaded, downloaded book from, from Amazon. And, and so what they know is they know how many Bibles have been downloaded and they know how many verses have been highlighted and they know what verse has been highlighted the most. Do you know what verse that is? You think it's John 3.16? Just because you see it on TV at games, is it maybe Psalm 23, uh, a Psalm of Comfort, or 1 Corinthians 13 because of all the weddings we like to read that at? Well, well here's, here's something that you may not know. According to Amazon, two verses highlighted together are the most highlighted verses in all of the Bible, and it's from Philippians chapter 4, and it's verse 6. Oh, I just forgot to go there. There you go. This I already said. Look at this. 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now think about that. What does that tell you about our culture? What does that tell you about that most downloaded book that these are the most downloaded verses? This verse resonates the most because it's dealing with anxiety. And I just, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I, I believe that the greatest joy killer of all is anxiety and worry. Because anxiety and joy cannot coexist. Wherever one is present, the other one is absent. They, they, there's no blending of the two. Anxiety kills joy with two simple words that can dominate our thoughts. What if? Understand. Anxiety is the result of assuming control and responsibility over things that do not recognize that we are master over them. And it causes stress and it causes worry. That is, the things that do not answer to you. Where this shows up the most is in the thing we have the least control over, and that thing is something we call the future. And no matter how you wrestle and struggle and fight, it will not obey your will. You have no control of where it's at. So anxiety is just a full load of what-ifs about our future. Now, some of these what-ifs are small and others are big, but in, in the moment, they're all big. It's all your mind can handle. That, that's why this is such a joy killer. What, what, what if my boy doesn't make the team? What, what if we never get pregnant? What if I never get married? What if the cancer comes back? What if that foolish kid of mine just never gets his act together? And what if they let me go at work? Here's the thing. The reasons for anxiety are not going to go away. That, that, is, that is life here on earth. Because altogether, these reasons are called life, and life, as we know, is hard, but joy will go away. You can't what if and keep your joy. In fact, if you keep what ifing, your joy will just disappear. If you try to deal with anxiety in your own humanity, with your own resources, there's just not going to be enough joy left. So here's some insight. When Paul encourages us to cling to joy, he has no encouragement for the atheist. And he has no words of counsel for the agnostic. Paul is writing to followers of Jesus. You just want that to sink in. He's writing to people saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, looking forward to the hope of a final resurrection and being in heaven with God forever. And already the what ifs have caught up with him. And he says, I want you to get this joy back. You've got to face this anxiety. 
And the way he does that is he reminds us that as a Christian, yes, we live in a natural body, and yes, there is a natural realm, but we are called, invited into what is called a divine nature. And we need to relearn in our brains or retrain or be reformed in our brains about how we see this world and start to think about the kind of life that the divine nature gives. And that's what I want to do in our quick outline this morning. So here's the first thing in our text that I see Paul saying, and that is we need to worry about nothing. Oh, there it was. Worry about nothing. That's what he says. Do not be anxious for anything. Now, listen. I think this is an indicator that Paul does not believe that people are born worriers. You might have said that about yourself, might have thought that about someone else. But the truth is, and Paul's kind of stating this here, we actually learn to worry. Now, I love this about bad habits. If you can get a bad habit, you can retrain yourself to get a better habit. And if you can learn worry, especially with divine help, you can unlearn worry as well. And I think this is the way we need to look at it. And, and, and so we, we can do that. And I know some of you are immediately, this is like a, this is a touchy topic. And some of you are saying, Josh, look, you, it's just ridiculous for you to say people shouldn't worry. Don't worry. And, and here's the point. I'm not saying that. In fairness, Paul is. And if you want to know where Paul gets it, Paul actually gets this from Jesus. And so we ought to really pay attention to this. We ought to think about where this comes from. And if you want to know, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6 at verse 25, Jesus says, so I tell you, don't worry. You see that? Don't worry about food or drink you need to live on. No, don't worry about clothes you need for your body. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. And then he goes further. Look at the birds, which is an odd thing to do for someone worried about the day. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them, and you know that you're worth much more than the birds. You cannot add time to your life by worrying about it. So Jesus says two things about worry, and I think we need to grasp this to get what Paul's teaching. First, he says, worry is worthless. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's the ultimate hamster wheel for the human life. You're spinning and spinning and spinning, and you've made no traction. It's just not going anywhere. Worry accomplishes nothing. You don't add a single dollar to your bank account. You did not subtract one single cancer cell from your body by worrying about it. All your worry about the future accomplished was it made your today miserable. You see it? But even more than being worthless, I believe what Jesus is saying is worry is faithless. You think about that. When we worry, what we've done is we've erased the promises of God from our mind. Those are distant words. They have no power. They're not reality to us. And worry just is faithless because it denies what God has promised. And when we have anxiety, we are basically marking the spot where we don't believe God's going to do what he said he would do. God can't care about me. And he can't do anything about this. That's what worry does. So Jesus suggests something. Look, I love this. Jesus doesn't just say, don't worry. He says, here's what you do. Do you see it? He says, take a hike. Get outside. Start looking at the natural world. Start to see the order of design and purpose. And you could even look for a bird. I'm not encouraging everybody to be bird watchers. Uh, th this is something my brother's taken on later in his life. Uh, too much ridicule from his little brother. Um, but if you do, that's fine. Look at him. See what God has ordered. See how well he provides and takes care of what he made. And realize in the moment that what God is saying in nature to you in your moment is, I've got this. So what do we do to keep from worrying? And there's some answers in our text here in Philippians 4. And the first step is this. Stop. Stop. <laughs> stop worrying. You know when it starts. And so stop. If you start at the beginning, stopping at the beginning, it just gets you a, a lot more time back in your life. And so the first way to take charge of your anxiety is to remember that God's in charge of the world. Now, the Bible repeatedly tells us to stop certain behaviors and attitudes. And I would, I would just hate to be a part of any church or, or preaching or teaching that says Christianity is all about what you don't do, because that's not what the Bible teaches. 
But there are things the Bible says don't do, but God's created this plan of, of, of distributing things the right way. And actually it would be um, the, the idea of um, taking something out and putting something on it. Paul uses this language an awful lot uh, in his writing. It's, it's the law of displacement in science. And that is, if you're going to empty something, it can't just stay empty. You got to fill it back up. And so every time God tells us don't do this, he isn't just saying, just focus on doing nothing. He's saying, if you do that, you're preventing yourself from doing what I want you to. So he fills us up with something else. And so after Paul says, stop this, he goes on to tell us what to start. And there's a couple things here. Worry about nothing and pray about everything. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, or it just kind of worded a different way. I think it's the new century says, don't worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything. I think that's a great thought for us to keep in our mind. You should know this. God loves the sound of your voice. I was recently thinking about prayer, and I, I think I mentioned the first night, I, I sent my firstborn off about a year ago now, and, uh, and I'm excited for him but I miss him. And I find this weird irony that as soon as he was gone, I realized how much I liked him. Like moving was a great idea. And then I, I, would, I missed him. And I love my son. And I, I think he loves his mom and me because he'll call quite a bit. And I will tell you, <laughs> there is nothing that I'm doing that if I see his number show up, I won't stop what I'm doing and pick up that phone because I love to hear his voice. And if as an evil father, and that's what Jesus calls earthly fathers, we're as good as we can be, but we're not the heavenly father. If I love to hear my son's voice, what do you think God thinks when you call on him? He loves to hear from his children and the creator of the universe. There's nothing he won't drop to hear you and listen to your voice. And he frankly would love to hear from you a little more often. And he doesn't need you to use big, long, religious words. And he doesn't need you to change the way you speak. He just wants to hear your voice, to check in and tell him how your day is going and tell him how you feel about it. And God will never put you on hold. See what happens when we just talk with God and just talk to him. We start to realize how sovereign he is. And at the same time, how merciful he is. And there's no concern too small for God to on with us. And there's no problem too big for God to take a moment with us. It'll help our spirit just talk with someone who can actually do something about what we're facing. Someone who actually holds this future we often wrestle with. In fact, the way the Apostle Peter words this, he's, he's talking about prayer. You cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And for me, growing up uh, on the shore of Lackamas Lake and sometimes in a boat when we could get one, and trying to teach my kids not that long ago how to fish, I, I, I resonate here. This, this, this sticks in my brain. Uh, I hear cast and I'm thinking about fishing. I, you want to get that thing just as far out as you can. Now, the hard thing about teaching my kids when they were little to fish is they love to cast. They didn't love to wait. And so it was cast and reel it in and cast and reel it in. So they caught nothing. And here's the problem. So many times with prayer, we cast our anxieties on God, but we see someone else to complain to. We see somewhere else to say it. Or we see something online that bothers us, and we reel it back in and we deal with it ourselves. We got to stop reeling in what God says belongs with him. So you cast it on God and you leave it with God. That's what we do with our worry and our anxiety. And, and maybe this will help make sense of it. It's a, a silly story about a notorious warrior. Every, everyone he knew, right? you're a stress case. You worry about everything. This can't be good for your health. It certainly isn't good for all of us. You're, you're hard to be around. It isn't great. And one day his friends noticed, like, this is a different guy. He's easy going. He's, he's just like, life's no problem. I'm like, what, what have you done? You're not the same person. He said, no, no, I, I actually hired somebody to do all my worrying for me. And they're like, well, it's working. How do you do that? How, how much does it cost? He goes, I pay this guy $10,000 a month. He said, $10,000? Well, how do you pay for that? He goes, that's his problem. 
Now, now, now listen. Why don't we, free of charge, start giving our worries to someone who can actually do something with them? You can't hold them. You can't wrestle with Give them to God. And he's up all night anyways. You don't worry about the cost. Jesus paid that cost. The, the, the contract exists in heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. It would do our spirit good if we spent more time bending our knees and less time letting our hearts sink. It'll lift you up if you bow down and take it to God. And there's so much power in what Paul's telling us here. And so again, in verse 6, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And so here's another thing you can do. Give thanks about anything. One thing I, I have learned about joyful people more than anything else is that they are thankful people. And I want you to understand, they aren't people where everything's just lined up the way they want. They're just, they find ways to be thankful regardless of what life brings them. Worry about nothing, pray about everything, give thanks about anything, because worry refuses to share a heart with gratitude. Gratitude just, just breaks worry up. It can't stand it. So Paul says, you bring things that are making you anxious to God and bring it along with thanksgiving. Now, how can I do that? How, how can I be thankful when I don't know how it's going to turn out? When what if is just flooding my mind? I can't thank God until I get the answer I want. Well, Paul says you can. If you remember that the one you're talking to is good and is working all things out for your good, whether you see that or not, and for the good of those who love him, you can do this. And so let's just kind of look at this a little closer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Remember, the guy who wrote this is in prison. So clearly, Paul believes you can change your attitude, regardless of where you're locked up. Even when you have no power to change your situation, you can change your attitude. He says basically, by the way, the same thing to the, the church in Thessalonica. Always be joyful, pray continually, and give thanks whatever happens. That is what God wants for you in Jesus Christ. I like to add on to this. This is what God wants for you. God doesn't want to look down and see his children so worried and stressed with things that he would gladly help them out with and take off their minds and help them with joy. He doesn't want to see that happening. What he wants for you is this always be joyful. And notice also, this is what Christ should do for you. This is what having Jesus does for us. Constant joy, constant prayer, constant thanks. Now, again, how can I be thankful for all circumstances. And I'll be very careful here. He doesn't tell you to be thankful for all circumstances. There are times when in prayer, all I can say is, this is awful. And I don't know what to do with this. But I know, God, if you weren't here, it would be the end of me. I've got you. Help me with this. I, I can't be thankful for every circumstances that come. And he didn't tell us to. He said, be thankful in all circumstances. You see, joy is not the destination. It's what we're clothed with to get us through any situation. Joy in God that does not leave us. I, I look for examples of this in my life, and I love the story of a Scottish preacher, Alexander White was his name, and he was famous for starting every, every sermon he gave with this prayer of thanks. And so one, one day in Scotland, it was just an awful winter day. The wind was blowing sideways. The rain was coming down, and it hurt. It was so cold. And, and the congregation was sitting there waiting for him to, to, to say this prayer, and they were wondering, what is he possibly going to say today to be thankful? And this is what he prayed. We thank thee, Lord. That is not always like this. And I have taken comfort in that. Because pain in life fills you up see anything else but if you get on your knees and you take that pain to God it'll shrink just enough to say you know God it's not always like this 
there's been better times and there may be better times, but no matter what, God, God, you're with me and you're here. You see, life in the human nature starts with circumstances, but life in the divine nature starts with Jesus. The principle Paul's teaching is that we should, no matter what, offer up some worship. This is one thing we miss about worship. We, we tend to make it all about ourselves, like everything else. And so I want to sing the song I want, and I want to sing it as fast as I want, and I want to sing the verses that I want. And, you know, if we got this perfect worship, then I'm going to have the experience I want. And that's not what worship is. Worship is about God. And I have worshiped with a heavy heart. And I have worshiped through tears. And I can tell you, I have worshiped when I didn't want to do it. But it made me focus on God. And this is what Paul is saying. You lean into that divine nature. And it changes the way you see and view your circumstances. Bring God your prayers. Bring him some thanks. Bring him your praise. And what happens when we do this is our spirit becomes calm. Because we're remembering he's made promises. And he keeps his promises. And we have Jesus. And he's in control. I'm not, but he is. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our sins are totally washed away by the blood of Jesus. We are, we're, we're assured of absolute eternal salvation, and we have protection from destructive demonic forces. And in those moments, we understand that the future can't threaten us. The what-ifs can't change this. So worship brings the perspective I need. And now when the worship and the prayer is over, the battle for joy is not. And so I want to emphasize verse six and seven as we did, but not forget verse eight. <laughs> Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. Now, let's put this all together. Worry about nothing, pray about everything, give thanks about anything, and think about good things. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the word worry literally means divided mind. That, that makes sense when you start to think about worry and what it does. It, it means your mind is in this battle over thoughts that control your mind. And so what, what's that thought going to be? And if you're going to stop that old behavior, again, we have to start thinking in a new kind of way. But listen, life will not let you drift into new ways of thinking. It'll always pull you back to that lowest thought. And so there's got to be some intention here. See, life will always take you inevitably toward the path of negative thinking. I don't care if you're the most positive person. Our inner thoughts are just built that way. And so you have to stop it. Um, I'll give you a, a quick illustration, but it starts with a musical quiz. <clears throat> I'll warm up here. If I'm doing this, I, I want to know what the next lyrics are. You ready? Dun, 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 dun. You guys got it? If anybody thinks it's everybody dance now, you're absolutely right. And you don't have to be born in the 90s to know it. It's sung everywhere, right? It's like this great power chant. I think jock rock is where it really took off. Now, I heard this story about this man in Canada, Montreal, actually, a dad who was driving home from work. And after a long day of work, he was kind of excited about going home. And so this song comes on and he cranks it. And he is screaming at the top of his lungs, everybody dance now. Right? He's just into it. And before he knows it, he sees sirens behind him. And he knows they're going somewhere else. And so he calmly, well, screaming his song, pulls over. And before he knows it, four cops are at both sides of his doors and, and they're, they're pulling him over. He's like, what's the problem? He's like, why are, why are you going crazy in here? He's like, this is my happy song. And they said, no, this, this, is, this, is, uh, this is screaming. And, and they gave him a ticket for $108 for verbal uproar. Now, here's why I bring that up. Life doesn't want you to have happy thoughts. This world isn't built for you to be filled with joy. You got to go out of this world to grab hold of and hold on to and cling to where joy really comes from. This world is insistent that you have negative thoughts and that you have them all the time. And so we let our culture fill our mind with this negative junk. 
Did you know that our media exists to keep us upset? That's all it is. It wants you fighting with one another, mad at one another, and, and even if they're people you never see, mad at that group, mad at that group, and just constantly upset. I, I heard this, uh, and I actually love the way it said this. It, they said, you know, the, the internet's there, and it's trying to keep you upset, and if you don't know this, the internet has always been upset. And so you got to be careful about those thoughts, because the world is all headed that same way. In fact, the media gets its ratings based on how good they're doing at keeping you afraid and upset. Because if you're not, why would you tune in? Nobody's got good news. We don't do it for fun. The purpose is to give us something to be angry about every single day. And if you think social media news is any different, you have been living under a rock, even though you have good internet access. Look, I just, I could rant about this one all day long. But I'll just keep it simple. Nobody wants to have a conversation anymore. They just want to give their comment. And they want to comment on your comment. And this is people, you may never see them face to face. In fact, what we've learned recently, some of them may not even actually exist. And you're fighting with them. You know, I, I always say to myself, who's the dummy now? Get off of this and get into where joy comes from and think about where your joy is at. And, and, and we think somehow we can, we can be the ones through my comment and my interaction to somehow escape the principle of sowing and reaping. But I'm telling you, if you sow negative thoughts in your mind, you will reap a negative spirit. And here's something I know. If Christians have a negative spirit, the church will not grow as God intended. That's not his message. Paul says, you don't have to live this way. You can take responsibility for the thoughts that you have through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll go to Ephesians 4.23 on this. He says, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitude. And again, Ephesians 5, you, or Galatians 5, you got the fruit of the Spirit, and joy is in there. See, Paul knows you're not coming up with this on your own. You're not through the power of positive thinking. You're not, because you were raised by positive people, going to be a joy-filled person. You need Jesus, and you need His Spirit. And by the way, He's got to renew it. That subscription expires almost every day. And so you renew it. The Spirit renews it. We can embrace the divine nature. We can tap into divine resources that empower us to live above our circumstances. When we embrace the divine life, the divine life embraces us back. When you unplug from what's unreal and destructive and negative and plug in to this spiritual power, you're never out. So go back and read one of the most stunning promises of the Bible. And that's verse 7. See, after we're told, don't worry, and we're told all these things to do, we're given this promise. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, listen. Listen. Paul is not saying that if we pray and thank and think that all of our what-ifs are just going to disappear. What he is saying is that if we pray and thank and think is that peace is going to come. That, that's, that's our access to the peace that God delivers. And it, it, listen, it is a supernatural peace. It is a peace that will guard your heart and guard your mind. It is a peace that says to our what-ifs, even if. And that's power. Peace says the winds and the waves still know your name. But through it all, my eyes are on him. Notice that Paul does not say that the, the peace from God. And I think that's a really important note. He says the peace of God. And I think about it in these I need a peace of God every day. I need the whole thing. But this is a peace of God that is peace from God, right? I mean, it's just, it's him. It's so beautiful to think about it. There's a peace that is God's peace that gets downloaded into all reality and it guards our joy that the world is constantly shooting at and picking at and trying to steal. And you don't have to drop it because his peace is your protection. And again, it turns our what ifs into even ifs. And that's what we all want. I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of a spiritual family that is living and teaching the next generation that 
What our life about here is about even if, not what if. I just recently went through uh, Daniel as a, a series of lessons, and, and it's just hard not to be impressed with these few young men. And that's sadly the way it always works. It was never the multitude. It was just a few who faced with a loss of life, had such trust in God. They said, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need to answer you. And we're not bound down to your image because our God's going to rescue us. But even if, even if we die in this fire, even if I lose this job, even if he leaves or she leaves, even if I lose, even if they do, God will deliver us, O King. Whether in this body or from this body someday, I know the future because God revealed it. I try to put this in some real terms for me. And I was thinking a lot about my Aunt Wendy and my Uncle John, who to know them are two of the most joy-filled people you could meet. You, you don't laugh as much with anybody as you do with my aunt and uncle. They, they laugh at themselves. They laugh with each other. And that's an important thing to do. And they just laugh at life. And, and I was thinking about them and, and kind of threw Philippians the other day. And there are things you pick up when you're older that you just don't see when you're young. They were just contagiously kind and contagiously joyous and contagiously Christian. And that's what I saw. And I, I didn't know that all they wanted was to have kids and that they just couldn't do it. And I didn't realize the stress or the strain that would put on a marriage to go through some of the hardships and adoption that they went through as they adopted my three cousins who were just extra cousins. It was easy for me. And I didn't know with their third child, Seth, that they had their toughest battle of all. Uh, through all of the court dates and he was with them and then not with them and then finally with them again. By the time all that settled, they realized he had a very severe intellectual disability. And I didn't realize the, the daily struggle that was just to kind of keep him moving forward and hoping for him to have a future because they were continually filled with joy. Their view was we asked God for a family and we've got it. And whatever it comes with, all right, God says we've got it. And they kept joy in the Lord and hope in the Lord and trust in the Lord. And they just gave thanks. And here's the shame. How many of us look in on situations like that and said, boy, that's got to be hard. It's got to be rough. I'll tell you a better way to see that is that's got to be impossible if they don't have God. And don't think you're any better. Your, your kids may be healthy and they may be doing everything you want off to the career you hope they'd have. You better hope they got God because the day comes when life hits you so hard and you don't know what to do. And if you don't have a God to look to with this, this kind of hope, with this promise of peace and joy, there is no hope for you in this world. And so what I would say to all of us is, though we're often unprepared and uncertain about our future, you can still be filled with joy because we serve a God who's holding our future in his hands. And I have found it somewhat exciting as life goes on when the next trial comes. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not cynical. I, I don't think so at all. I think I've tried to see things through a different window and, and I just kind of expect certain things. I'm leaving town a couple days ago and I just happen to know that I would get a call at the airport that all of a sudden Katie's tire is flat. Of course. Of course, I'm not there to help. This is when that happens. And we can laugh about it and try to figure that out. That's just life. And there have been calls that are a lot harder than that. And you don't know what to do. But you know God. And you know he'll see you through. And one thing I've come to understand is he's doing something in that moment that I would never do for myself. I might say I want to grow. I might say I want to know him closer. He says, okay, let's put that to the test. Because the best character, the best of us is built in hard times. And you just got to remember, if God could not perfect his own son, his own perfect son, without the suffering of the cross, how are you going to make it through this life without some kind of suffering? But God doesn't do that for you just so you suffer. He does it so you can see real joy. 
and your circumstances do not determine it. And so what if life gives you lemons? What if life falls apart? What if my worst fears come true? Well, for the Christian, we stop saying what if, and we say even if these things happen. Jesus has promised me joy. And my hope for all of us is that we will come to a place that Paul came to. Oh, hopefully for you, it won't be prison in Rome, but it'll be a place where you feel imprisoned and you will say, there is no place you can put me where I will not have joy in Jesus Christ. And I thank you for your attention this morning. If you're not a Christian, and we're going to see this in a moment, you can be buried with Jesus Christ. You'll die. Now, again, to be clear, you're going to come back to life real quick. But it is, it is the surrender of your will. Folks, that's what makes us so miserable. We're trying to run this show, and you're not doing a good job of it. You surrender your will. Your old man dies, and you raise to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that power lives in you. And now, when all the what-ifs come, you can say, I know the one who holds the future. And if you're here today and you want to be a part of that, the baptistry will soon be filled. And you can join Jesus Christ. If we can help you in any way, you can let us know. And I would, I would encourage you as well. Let us know if we can pray for you. I, I just think one of the things the internet has kind of put into my brain is we spend a whole lot of time saying and doing nothing when we should be talking about each other in prayer. And we can help you out. We'd sure love to do that. So let us know.
So we'll have a closing prayer here and we'll take a couple of minutes to visit together and allow uh, us to get set up for the baptism. I hope you'll all stay for that. Um, what a joyous thing to do today in the midst of all of this lesson to have a baptism. Uh, praise the Lord for that. So if you would uh, join with me in prayer, we'll draw our meeting to a close here for the, now. Uh, and I do, again, want to extend to all of you that uh, if you can, uh, come uh, join us at the potluck. We'll have lots. We always do. We always take food home. So it's good. Just come. Um, uh, we'll be meeting at Estelle's place, and then we'll be back here at 2 o'clock. Uh, plus or minus two o'clock um, and we'll have uh, Josh's final lesson. So if you would uh, join with me. Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you in prayer at the close of this, uh, of Josh's lesson. And Father, so, so grateful for the message uh, that Josh brought to us today, because if there's, if there's one uh, thing Certainly there are many things that bind us together, but if there is one thing that we all share in common, we all worry. And we all allow this life to have much, much more of a hold on us than it ought to. And so, so grateful for this message this morning. And uh, Father, just pray that every one of us today can draw a line in the sand and say from this moment on, uh, we are going to be uh, a people that are much less worrisome and much more prayerful and much more trusting in you. Just so grateful for the lesson. And Father, you know um, how, how I have uh, personally uh, prayed for this congregation worried and worried over it as it has grown smaller and uh, as I've seen the uh, impact that so many factors uh, the virus and many other things that have had on this congregation and father you know how Chris and I have prayed that this congregation can be can grow and become more vital and become more of a word for you. And Father, uh, we have worried over that. And uh, just uh, starting today, dear Father, help, help me, help Chris and I to uh, just be so joyful at the opportunity that we have to be uh, your congregation here and to be so joyful of the opportunity that we have, small as we are, to gather ourselves together each Lord's Day and throughout the week uh, to, uh, to rejoice in our salvation. And, and, uh, and I am confident, dear Father, that as this congregation lets that light shine more and more of our thanksgiving and our joy in Christ Jesus, that this place will grow and become uh, what we need to be here. So grateful for the message. So grateful for the message that we have heard today. And just uh, pray, dear Father, that every one of us can own that message uh, and make it real in our lives. that you'll hear our prayer and accept our thanks to your Father as we ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.